A woman with an open book is something you see quite often in medieval and early modern European painting. Sometimes a religious figure, such as the Virgin Mary or St. Mary Magdalene, a symbolic figure, an allegory, a sibyl or a muse, or a real woman shown in the act of reading, an image seen more often in art as literacy increased and scenes of private life became more popular. In portraits, the sitter is sometimes shown with a book, included because it says something important about her life and character. For example, Émilie du Châtelet was a scientist, and her portrait shows her with a scientific text open on her desk as she works. The lady in this portrait was a poet. She is shown with an open book of verse. The lines are handwritten in an elegant Italian cursive script and are quite legible. The lady is holding the book towards the viewer, keeping the pages open with her fingers to offer a clear view of what is written. The inclusion of such a book in a portrait of a poet is natural and appropriate. But the verses in the book are not her own. The book is very prominent, placed in the foreground, framed by the sitter's hands and fingers, and painted with a play of light and shadow that creates a striking three-dimensionality, contrasting with the flatness of the sitter's figure. It seems as if the book is projecting beyond the picture plane towards the viewer, so that while the lady turns her head away, unreadable, the book presents itself and wills the viewer to read. This portrait was painted in Florence around 1560 by the artist Daniolo de Cosimo di Mariano Torri, known as Il Bronzino. The subject is the poet Laura Batiferi. This is one of the most striking of Renaissance portraits. There is something unearthly in the sharp-edged, elongated figure, with its unnatural but commanding pose, rigid formality, and atmosphere of cold remoteness. The subject is shown three-quarter length against a plain background devoid of detail or furnishings. Her body is turned towards the viewer, but her head, dramatically and decisively, is turned away, so that her face is shown in profile. Her skin is pale and flawless, resembling ivory. Her domed forehead, prominent nose, Slightly downturned but determined mouth suggest intellectualism and rationality, a strong character and self-contained personality. She wears a transparent veil, and her clothing is rich but restrained in colour and style, with little jewellery. A book, held by her long, elegant fingers, is prominent in the foreground, seeming to project from the visual space of the otherwise flattened picture plane. This is an enigmatic and compelling portrait of one of the most remarkable of Renaissance women. Laura Battiferi, who was born in 1523 and died in 1589, was a celebrated poet whose learning and literary accomplishments were famous throughout Italy and were known and admired as far away as Spain, Bohemia and Germany. She won the praise of Michelangelo and Cellini, among many others, and was honoured by her contemporaries as the new Sappho. Laura Battiferi was not herself a Florentine. She was born in Urbino to parents who were both members of the nobility. Her father was a clergyman, so Laura was of course illegitimate, but she was acknowledged by her father, who gave her an excellent education and arranged for her to be legitimised by Pope Paul III when she was twenty. She seems to have developed early in life the character she would always retain, powerfully intellectual, profoundly religious, with a pious devotion to the Church which would later make her a strong supporter of the Counter-Reformation and particularly of the Jesuits, rather austere in personality, but with artistic creativity that drew on wells of deep feeling, and which found expression in literature, above all in poetry. 
Laura's first marriage ended after just a few years with the death of her husband, and she remarried at age 27 to the sculptor and architect Bartolomeo Amanati. This marriage was devoted and mutually supportive, although childless. At first they lived in Rome, but when Bartolomeo lost his main patron with the death of Pope Julius III in 1555, they moved to Florence, a sad event for Laura, who lamented her forced departure from the city she loved in poignant and heartfelt verse. But her poetic gifts truly flourished in Florence, where poetry was embedded in every aspect of the city's culture. She gained renown as a poet and became part of the city's humanistic, literary and artistic elite. It was through those cultural connections that she became associated with the painter Bronzino. Both were part of the cultural flowering of Florentine arts and letters under the rule of Cosimo de' Medici. The Florentine Republic had finally been extinguished by the Medici with the support of Emperor Charles V in 1531 and Alessandro de' Medici became the first Duke of Florence. He had been murdered in 1537 and Cosimo, from another branch of the Medici family, had been chosen to succeed him. Cosimo effectively strengthened Florence's regional dominance and consolidated Medici power within the city by silencing republican sentiment, crushing dissent, exiling and executing political opponents. He and his supporters also oversaw the establishment of a new courtly culture of arts and letters in Florence, dominated by Medici patronage and devoted to enhancing Florentine and Medician prestige. Bronzino painted one surviving self-portrait in this altarpiece of 1552, Christ's Descent into Limbo, which he painted for the Church of Santa Croce in Florence. He has depicted himself as King David. Bronzino was a thoroughly Florentine painter. He was born in 1503 in Monticelli, just outside the city walls of Florence, and spent his whole career in the city, with the exception of short periods in Passaro, where he undertook commissions for the Duke of Urbino and in Rome. The origin of his nickname, Bronzino, is not known, but may relate to the darkness of his skin or the colour of his hair. He was a pupil of Pontormo, a leading painter of early 16th century Florence and a central figure in the rise of the Mannerist style with its distorted proportions, hermetic meanings and otherworldly atmosphere, which Bronzino also made his own. Bronzino was a prominent figure in Florence and played a leading part in the cultural life of the city in the 1540s and 50s. He was close to both Duke Cosimo and his wife, Eleanor of Toledo. She is the subject of one of his most impressive portraits, painted around 1545, and he had been official painter to the Florentine ducal court since preparing the decorations for their marriage ceremonies in 1539. He was a visual artist in various fields, including frescoes and tapestries, but was chiefly known as a painter, and particularly as a portraitist. His role as an official court artist naturally required him to produce many portraits of the leading political, noble, commercial and cultural figures of Medician Florence. As the frequent appearance of books in his portraits suggests, Literature was as much part of Bronzino's creative life as the visual arts. It was poetry, written in the Italian of Tuscany, not in Latin, that brought him close to Laura Betiferi. Their friendship was expressed through poems they wrote to each other, filled with epithet, mutual praise and wordplay. It was an entirely platonic relationship. Betiferi was very pious and very married, and Bronzino was almost certainly homosexual and fully part of the eroticized homosocial culture of the Florentine elite of his day. Bronzino's portrait of Batiferi can be seen as a visual testimony to their relationship. The identity of the sitter as Laura Batiferi was for long uncertain, but has been confirmed by modern scholarship. We do not know the exact date of the picture, with most authorities dating it between 1555 and 1560. It was certainly complete by the latter date, 
so Laura would have been in her thirties when she sat for it, and Bronzino in his fifties when he painted it. The circumstances under which it came to be painted are unknown, but it may have been commissioned to mark the publication in 1560 of Battiferi's first book, a collection of verses in Italian by herself and members of her circle. Her second book, a collection of penitential psalms translated into Tuscan Italian, a project which combined her religious piety with her commitment to the elevation of the Italian language, appeared in 1564. At the time of her death, in 1589, she was working on a third book, a compendium of her poetry. So we can interpret this portrait, produced around the time that Laura Betiferi's first book appeared, as a celebration of the sitter's status as poet and published author. Yet, as I said earlier, she is not the author of the book which she displays in her portrait. The verses she invites the viewer to read are not her own. They are instead by the 12th century poet and scholar Francesco Petrarca, known to the English-speaking world as Petrarch. This picture, painted by Giorgio Vasari in around 1544, shows six Tuscan literary figures. The three most prominent, their heads crowned with laurels, are, from right to left, Dante, the author of the Divina Commedia, Boccaccio, writer of the collection of prose tales known as the Decameron, and Petrarch, honoured in 16th century Florence for his scholarship and humanism and his passionate, elegant sonnets, or canzonieri. The Petrarchan sonnet has indeed become one of the most influential verse forms in Western literature. Between them, these three authors, all of whom were from Tuscany and wrote their greatest works in the Tuscan dialect of Italian, were credited with the elevation of the vernacular Italian language in verse and prose to the highest poetic and literary status. As we will see, Dante too is referenced in Bronzino's portrait of Laura Battiferi, but it is Petrarch's work that Laura holds in her hand. Much of Petrarch's most revered verse expressed his feelings for the idealized and unattainable love of his life, a woman called Laura di Noves. In Vasari's painting, Petrarch holds a book with a cameo portrait of a woman on the cover. The book represents his sonnets, and the woman on the cover is the Laura his sonnets celebrate, who shares her very name with the plant used to crown great poets, and which is associated with undying love, the laurel. Bronzino, a poet in painting and in words, also celebrates the beauty and accomplishments of a Laura, Laura Battiferi, and he does so by evoking Petrarch's Laura, an association which became so strong, particularly given the absence of any clear identification of the sitter until the 20th century, that images of this portrait were later reproduced as Petrarch's Laura, as in this engraved illustration from a collection of Petrarch's poems published in 1805. The pages of the open book in the portrait of our Laura, Laura Battiferi, display the handwritten text of two of Petrarch's love sonnets. On the left-hand page is Sonnet 64, which begins, Se voi poteste potebate segni, if you could, with troubled signs. And on the right-hand page is Sonnet 240, Io pregato amor e ne ripregio. I have prayed to love, and again I pray. These sonnets are not sequential. They have been brought together here for a particular reason. Both express the yearning of the author for his love, his Laura. Sonnet 64 seems particularly appropriate to the mood of the painting, with its references to Laura turning away her face and the implication that she is disdainful and distant. But it is Sonnet 240 which seems to be given more emphasis in the portrait, with Laura Betiferi's long fingers indicating and framing the first section of the sonnet, with its opening words in which the author pleads with love to make Laura forgive him for being driven by passion to cast off the restraints of reason. What is going on here is a form of role-play between Bronzino and Battiferi, in which they take on the aspects of Petrarch and Laura, and elevate their admiration for each other by association with this time-honoured and admired archetype 
of devoted love, out of the mundane and fleshly world and into the realm of the ideal, just as Bronzino's portrait seeks to depict the ideal Laura, the metaphysics of her existence as an eternal soul, as well as evoking the temporal reality of her physical presence. Thus, Bronzino has Laura point to Sonnet 240. Petrarch's argument is that the heat of passion must, however difficult the task, be contained by cool and sober reason, and you do not have to spend very long looking at a Bronzino portrait to see that this was Bronzino's argument too. Many aspects of this painting contribute to its overall atmosphere of cool detachment and sober restraint. The subject's face and posture, the plainness of the background and the subdued palette, the picture's symmetry and linearity. Look, too, at the typically mannerist distortions of proportion in Laura Batiferi's figure, particularly the smallness of the head, the exaggerated slope of the shoulders, the long, slender fingers and the elongated neck, and at her clothing and personal adornments. The clothing Laura Batiferi wears is sober but not sombre. It is slightly old-fashioned for circa 1560, but is quietly rich, making clear her status as a woman of wealth and position, but showing too the restraint and decorum suitable to a married woman who is also, through her first marriage, a widow. She wears a white linen long-sleeved undershirt with a close-fitting ruched and embroidered collar fastened by a gold button. Bronzino has exaggerated the thin parallel folds of the upper part of this garment to strengthen the visual convergence of the composition towards the sitter's head. Her dress is dark green damask with sleeves of a deep wine colour slashed to reveal green undersleeves. A shell-shaped cap of grey and white silk covers her hair which is coiled beneath it and a very thin, near-transparent veil of very fine muslin covers her head and shoulders and is held in place by one gold pin in the cap and another at her bosom. Apart from those pins and the button which fastens the collar, Laura wears only two items of jewellery, a long gold chain round her neck which is tucked into her bodice and a gold ring mounted with a rectangular black stone, small but prominent, on the third finger of her left hand. Compared to the visual richness of some of Bronzino's other portraits of wealthy and important women, his depiction of Laura Batiferi is sober, modest and restrained. She is elevated, intellectual and unassailably virtuous. Yet a small triangle of bright red beneath the left arm indicates the presence beneath this cold exterior of the fires of passion. This is how American art historian Arthur McComb summed up the distinctive qualities of Bronzino's portraiture in his 1928 book, Agnolo Bronzino, His Life and Works. Bronzino, everywhere insisting on the social position of his sitters, employs all manner of devices to render their magnificent apartness. He portrays them with long fingers and long noses. He always emphasises the vertical, vertical folds of a curtain background or long pilasters of cool grey stone. The arms he lets follow the lines of the body. They are never crossed or seen an emphatic gesture. The fingers never grasp anything. They merely seem to touch, to hold ever so slightly. Repose, reserve and elimination of all fussiness, of all anecdote is sought. And yet, Despite this insistence on the outward aspect and status of the sitter, there is never any trickiness or mere conventional elegance of content. Everything is subordinate to an incredible precision and firmness of outline, to an overwhelming sense of style. The portrait of Laura Batiferi is Bronzino at his most Bronzino-esque. In one of the poems he wrote to her, he described her in a play on her surname, as tutto dentro di ferro e fuor di ghiaccio, all iron within and ice without. And his painting of her certainly conveys strength, coolness 
and self-containment. The fact that she is shown in profile contributes significantly to this impression. Profile portraits were popular in the 15th century, particularly for women, and there are notable examples by Piero della Francesca, Filippo Lippi and others. But by the mid-16th century, profiles were out of favour, with full-face or three-quarter-face portraits being much more widespread. Why did Bronzino adopt what was, by the 1560s, very much an archaic style? Partly it is the sense of detachment that we have already talked about. Laura does not meet the onlooker's eye, but looks away with a distant, elevated gaze, explicitly refusing connection with the viewer of the portrait. But also, by painting Laura Batiferi in profile, Bronzino, already evoking Petrarch in the open book, has the opportunity to draw a parallel between this poet of his own time and another great Florentine poet of a former age, Dante. The image of Dante in profile is so well established and familiar as to be almost a cliché. The thin and finely sculpted and serious face, with firm mouth, high cheekbones, deep-set eye and aquiline nose, have been present in pictures of Dante since the earliest known portrait of the poet, a fresco of the 1320s in the Palazzo del Polesta in Florence, attributed to Giotto, and now much restored. The nose became larger as the years went by, and the features more emphatic, but the image remained consistent and found expression in work by many artists. Bronzino had himself painted Dante in the early 1530s with just these characteristics. This is a copy of the original, attributed to Bronzino's workshop or to a follower. The original was identified in the 1990s and is now in a private collection. A drawing of Dante in profile was produced by Bronzino at around the same time, and a comparison of this with the profile of Laura Batiferi shows marked similarities, sufficient to suggest that the artist was equating this poet with her great Florentine predecessors, Dante as well as Petrarch. In this way, Bronzino celebrates Batiferi not only as a beautiful and accomplished woman and a great poet in her own right, but as a worthy inheritor of the historical tradition of great poets who have elevated Florentine poetry in Italian to levels that rivaled the heights of classical literature in Latin. Just as a poet and a painter came together to create Bronzino's portrait of Laura Batiferi, so, in a very Florentine way, do the practices of poetry and painting meet in this image. The book and the texts within it proclaim the allegiance of both sitter and painter to Petrarch, and the profile of the sitter connects her additionally with the great figure of Dante. The lady is represented as a figure of beauty and virtue, but her portrait seems very remote from the flesh and blood woman she really was. The artist has sought to show the beauty of her soul as well as of her worldly body, and to place her in an ideal realm of reason and beauty free from the destructive attentions of passion and of time. It is into that world that she gazes, not the world in which her portrait and the viewers of her portrait have their existence. So she turns her head decisively away, preventing any engagement by the onlooker with her face or her gaze, and blocking access to her inner world. And it is the book she holds, not the woman who holds it, that turns its face towards the viewer and reveals itself. <laughs>